seated. Uh, happy to see we are using our vocal cords. We are expressing to the world that there is a God and He is alive. Because people in this world are very confused. And it's important for us to let our light shine and let the world know the truth. We are so happy today to be here. Amen. We could have been anywhere else, but we chose with the free will that we have that God gave us to give God his due praise. For in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when the earth was without form and void, the spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters of the deep. And our God spoke everything that we see and experience into existence. For the Bible says, God says, let there be light. And in 1 John, we know that God is light. And we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. And when we do that, we have fellowship with him. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was formulated by words. Colossians and Romans <coughs> lets us know that all things that was created was created by Christ, the Word, for Christ, that Word. And holds together by Christ, that word. And we know that that word is life, according to 1 John, John chapter 1, verse 3. And that life is the light of men. That light shined in the darkness, but darkness did not comprehend it. But praise be to God that Jesus died, and on the third day he rose. And as baptized believers, we know that we have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. Amen? And Jesus is now ascended alive and well at the right hand of the Father, and he's looking for us to be that light, to be that light of this very dark world, to shine. We know that through God, we survive. I think sometimes we lose focus of that. Our God is alive. He created us from the dust of the ground, but we survive. We hold together. We exist because of God Almighty. And for that... We come and give him his due praise in spirit and in truth. At the woman at the well, Jesus told the woman that a time will come and now is where true worship will worship God in spirit and in truth. For God is spirit and therefore he is looking for such worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. So we came together this morning to remember his death, burial, and resurrection as was commanded to us. We came together to partake in a collection to give back to his work as was commanded to us. We came together to sing as was commanded to us. And we came together to hear a portion of God's word because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We are worshiping God at this time in spirit and in truth in the manner in which he decides he wanted to be worshiped. We came here this morning not to be entertained in and of itself. But to entertain God. God asked us to start our week off the first day of the week, giving him his due praise. He only asked for a few minutes. God could demand of you every morning to wake up and to come and to assemble and to worship. God has beings that he created that worship him all day and all night in a place where there is no day and there is no night. That just says, holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. And he asks us to use our free will to choose to follow not what we see, but what we do not see. So we are thankful that the Church of Christ of Bridgeport has decided to do God's will. Amen? Amen? There are many of our numbers who are sick and not among us. Brother Stanley was ill last week, but praise be to God, he is, a, he is home right now. He spent a week in the hospital. It was a scare for all of us. But it's a blessing because God is still God. Amen? Amen. And we know that this physical tent is deteriorating rapidly. Amen. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. Amen. My brother Paul taught us that through scripture. We know that brother Simeon is in the hospital right now at Griffin. And woke up Friday and his legs would not cooperate. But praise be to God, God was still God. Amen? Amen. And brother Simeon is in good spirits and he is able to move his legs and he was going for a walk yesterday and praise be to God if it be God's will he will be discharged tomorrow. Amen. We know
know that Deb and Nisha are in Nepal doing our gospel meeting there. The gospel meeting was a success. The brothers and sisters and visitors at that gospel meeting were blessed. Amen. But those two saints are sick. And Deb lost his voice and Nisha is sick. She has a fever and she's not doing well. But even though we're here and they're all the way in Nepal, 12 plus hours ahead, God is still God. Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing? God is still able to be a God in the time zone in Nepal and same time the time zone in Bridgeport. Amen. He is still God because Jesus said that he is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. And we pray that Deb and Nisha return to their health rapidly and that they have safe travels back to us. Brother Kuman will lead us in our scripture reading at this time of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse, verses 9 through 10. Or brother, if you could come forward. And if you would be so kind to read those two verses twice for our hearing. Good afternoon. But you are not a cho you are but you are not a chosen generation. Oh, I'm sorry. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. They are that, that you may proclaim his, the praises of him who called him out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who, are, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And I read it again. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praise, the praise of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. May God bless us all in this world. Thank you, brother. This concept of us being a royal priesthood is something that many of us struggle with. How many people woke up this morning feeling like they were a part of a royal priesthood, a chosen generation? Many times we wake up defeated. We imprison our minds with our doubts and our fears, our struggles, our limitations, and we already set forth for us a negative day. Amen? Sometimes we wake up and we already set forth a negative day. God forbid one or two things happen and we throw our hands up. And ever since then, negative after negative, right? And we, this day was horrible. Like, I shouldn't even got out of bed. That mindset comes from within. Right. Because the Bible says the rain is going to fall on the just and the unjust, right? So God isn't in heaven purposely making someone cut you off or making you forget your coffee on the top of your roof. God has bigger things to worry about. Those things just happen because of the world we live in, right? But those small things are so detrimental <coughs> to our dead. That it will disrupt our entire spiritual thinking. Isn't that a shame? Yeah. Literally, just the coffee flew out in the back of the window. And praise be to God, some of us, we can't even control our tongue. God forbid one car out of the thousands of cars on 95 seems to cut you off. And now all of a sudden, now that just ruined your whole existence, right? And we think sometimes, honestly, if we're honest... That God is testing us in those manners. That God has nothing better to do but to be moving cars on 95 like Legos. Like he had nothing else to do with China, Nepal, Africa, uh, west side of Compton, but to be moving cars in front of your way on 95 or, or Route 15. We feel that God is tricking us sometimes. That all the things we do for God, how come we're experiencing this or how come we're experiencing that? Not fully understanding this is the life we live in, right? Just like you have free will to obey traffic laws, 
I have the free will to not obey traffic laws. And if I decide to not put my blinker on and to change lane, my free will is now impeded upon your travel, right? That's between me and you. Praise be to God that God sent his guiding angels to make sure that I didn't hit you. But you didn't think of it that way. You thought of it as, this is a stumbling block for me to get to where I'm going. These little things in our lives become huge things. There's a saying that people make mountains out of molehills, right? We just look at a perspective is wrong. If the angle in which you look at that molehill is wrong, it will appear to be a mountain in your life. This is not how God wants you to live every day. As baptized believers, all of us in this room who are baptized, who have heard, who have believed, who have confessed, who have repented, who have put on Christ and have a daily relationship with God, First Peter tells us it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it's a pledge of a good conscience. We have the spirit of the Lord inside of us as a stamp of approval. We are the church, the body of Christ. As a church, we are a royal priesthood. Our religious friends are confused. They believe that a man should not marry, and they should take their collar and turn it around, and after so much schooling, they'll become a priest. And that priest will have the ability to pray for you. So when you sin, you go to that priest. But you're embarrassed, so you don't want to tell people the sin that you committed, so the priest will go into a booth, and you'll go on the other side of the booth. Now the booth has a mesh net. So I can see you as the priest, but I pretend to look the other way so you're not embarrassed. And in that booth, you profess all the sins that you've committed. And I listen as the priest. And after you're done, I say, you'll say X amount of prayers for X amount of times depending on the gravity of your sin. So maybe if it was a lie, you'll say a specific prayer two times. Maybe if you stole something, you say a prayer 50 times. And you do that thinking that I, as the priest, am the mediator between you and God. And then there's higher priests, which are bishops. And those higher priests can go to God on behalf of the lower priests in the congregation. And sometimes those higher priests, they need somebody to go to God on their behalf. So they have somebody higher than them. That's the Pope. And then that Pope has the ability to be the chief mediator between mankind and God. The problem is that's not in my Bible. So I'm confused. Because in the Bible that's in my hand, I see something very different. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom to all to be testified in due time. So it's important, we talked about in our Bible class this morning, when a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, it's important for us to understand that the tree still needed it. And when God is God, and there's no one around to do God's will or speak his truth, his truth is still truth. It doesn't matter how it looks out there. It doesn't matter the majority of the people that are believing certain things. God is still God. And we know from Scripture that as baptized believers, we are <coughs> saints. We were sinners, but we are saints. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who was not obtained in mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the title of this sermon is Saint Sinners, a royal priesthood. We are saints, but we are still sinners. Contrary to popular belief, Saints are not dead people. This past week or the week before, CNN reported that two previous popes had been made saints. I went to a Catholic high school and a Catholic college. Let me explain to you how people are made saints. They have to live a godly life according to the Catholic faith. And after they live their life and they die, 
there has to be at least two instances in which a miracle happened based on that person or individual people praying to you. That's why in their religious belief, they'll say, St. Mary, pray for us. Or St. Paul, pray for us. And after they've had some determination that these two miracles have happened because of this same thing, usually where that saint, that person was from, their neighborhood or something, would generate some funds and they would do a campaign to get that person canonized into being a saint. And then the Pope will have the ultimate say-so to say if that person is a saint or not. The problem is I don't see that in my Bible because the story of the rich man and Lazarus said what? The rich man said to Lazarus, who was in Lazarus' bosom, have Lazarus come and give me some relief. Lazarus didn't respond. Abraham responded, right? Abraham said, Lazarus can't come to where you are. Because you had your good time and Lazarus had his bad time. But regardless of that, there's a chasm between the two of them. You can't go there, you can't come here. The rich man said, well, send somebody back to the living, to my brothers. Abraham said, they have prophets. Let them hear those people. The rich man said, no. If somebody came back from the dead, then they would believe. Even if somebody came from the back from the dead, they wouldn't believe. See, the spiritual realm is not set up that way. Once people pass on, they can't pray for you. If you can't pray for them, you can pray that God had mercy on their soul. But there's nothing that can be done because it is appointed for man to die. And after that is the judgment. That's the way God has set it up. So it's important for us to understand that although there may be religious confusion, that's not how saints are made. Saints are made when people decide to put on Christ through the watery grave of baptism. And you became added to the church of Christ. And you are a member of that church. But don't get it twisted. You are just a saved sinner. Those of us who are baptized here sitting in this room are no better than those who are not baptized sitting in this room. The only difference, the only thing that separates us from them and them from us is we have the blood of Christ that is continually cleansing our soul on a daily basis. Meaning those sins that we commit willfully in word, action, and deed are being wiped away and God is remembering them no more. So that is the blessing of being saved. You have the blessing of being able to have God on your side. For we know in Scripture all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know from Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 25 that Paul emphatically gives us the struggle that even strong Christians have. For what I want to do, I don't do. For those things I don't want to do, I do willfully. And he concludes and say, who will save me, O wretched man? Praise be to God for Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So with focusing on this concept that we have been doing at this quarter with shedding the weight as a church and individually, we need to shed the sin in our life and get our souls spiritually fit. It's important for us to get on this spiritual health, fitness that we've been talking about individually for the Bible says we are to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Let's go back to our text, 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's hone in on the first three chapter, the first uh, three verses before we got to <coughs> verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, the first three verses. The Bible says, Therefore lay aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speak. The Bible is setting for us to shed it, right? Shedding away of all of the sin that is adding on to our spiritual soul. The things that are contrary to God's will. Let's set aside all malice, 
all guile, all hypocrisy, all evil, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I always like that the verse 3 is in there because you can only have a desire to move toward the pure milk of God if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Isn't that the five steps of salvation, right? First, I have to hear. So if I taste that hearing I experience, hopefully that will prick my heart and I will say, what must I do to be saved? Amen? So this concept of shedding away these sinful things that we desire to do is something that is we is we do some we do these things on a regular basis. But as newborn babes, we must desire the pure milk of the word. Think of it as a physical baby. We have to have a desire to raise a child up with the nutrition that will bless them, not with candy, not with sweet things. Not with solid food when they're not able to digest those things, but the pure milk. <coughs> and we know from the Bible that focusing on God's word is how we begin to grow. Verse 2 says that you may grow thereby. This concept of growth is something that the New Testament is filled with. We as Christians have to desire to grow. We cannot become stagnant. We have to grow. We have to continue to push ourselves spiritually. Matthew 18, verse 3, you can turn there, the passage is also up on the board. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? No matter what, if you get two people together, somebody want to be first, and somebody going to fight to not be last. Jesus called a little child to him. Set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Why? Why does God say that? Because children are completely dependent. They have no ability to exercise their own desires. They are relying on someone that is professing to love them to take care of them. And in relying, they're relying on them for their happiness, their well-being, their shelter, and also their nutrition. And that nutrition comes from the basic diet. Same thing from a spiritual standpoint. The only way to be great, the only way to grow, is to spiritually convert yourself as a little child being completely dependent on God Almighty. And when you are dependent on God Almighty, you rely on your nutritional value to come from the pure milk of God. The church is a spiritual house, and it's built for spiritual sacrifices. The Bible says in verses 4 through 5 of 1 Peter 2, continuing on, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, David had a desire to build God a house. God said, I, I don't dwell in things that are made by men. And it's interesting to me that God allowed them to build this temple. But in the New Testament, God says that you are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Which is why we come together on Sunday morning. We offer up a spiritual sacrifice as we pray it is a sweet-smelling aroma to God in the throne. So our purpose, one of the things that we are designed to be is a spiritual house built for spiritual sacrifices, according to Scripture. And we know that Christ is the living stone, but as Christ, we are also living stones. Christ is the chief stone, 
and we are built on that foundation. The church is also to be exalted because it's precious to God. Continuing on in verses 6 through 8. Therefore it is also contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. It's amazing to me the different reaction the world can have with God's word. You can have two people sitting here, one is a believer and one is a non-believer. First Corinthians says to that believer, the word of God is the power that they need. To the unbeliever, that same word that's being spoken is foolishness, right? The scripture is saying that this chief cornerstone is for one group of people, the one that is precious, they believe in, but to those that are disobedient, that same cornerstone has become a stumbling block. Wide is the gate to destruction, and many will go, but narrow is the path to righteousness, and few will go by it. But praise be to God, those that choose to go through that narrow gate will be exalted. And they are precious to God because they deny what they see in hopes to focus on what they do not see. We know from our text that the church is God's royal priesthood. Verse number 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his only special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now obtain mercy. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says there, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Jeremiah 32, verses 38 and 39. Jeremiah 32, verses 38 and 39. The Bible says, They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for, good, for the good of them and for their children after them. How many hearts? One heart. How many ways? One way. In the New Testament, we know there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism. It's important for us to weave these things together, to understand that God has a divine purpose for the church as a royal priesthood, that he has a desire to be their God and for them to be his people. And it's amazing of thinking of this concept of the church being a royal priesthood, the church being exalted, the church being precious to God, the church being a spiritual house built for spiritual sacrifices. The church focusing and growing on the pure milk of the word. It's amazing that of all those things, the church is comprised of saved sinners. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's amazing that God knows the things that you will do. He knows the desires that you have. He knows the rebellion that you will have in your heart. And the Bible says while you were still enemies, Christ died for the ungodly and the unjust. And he washes you of those things. 
even though he knows after he washes you, you'll still go back to the mud like a pig, and you'll dirty yourself up with the same things over and over again. But as long as you repent of those things, and you come back, and you ask God to renew a steadfast spirit within you, he'll forgive you, and he'll wash you once again. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Even though Paul healed the sick, even though Paul penned so many letters and did so many spiritual journeys, Paul still viewed himself as the chief sinner. Because there was a time where Paul persecuted the church. And when we say persecution, we don't mean making fun of or cyberbullying. We mean killing people that believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And even though he was baptized and forgave of those sinful acts, he still continued to sin. For we know from Romans chapter 7, even all the things that he did in his life, the things in which he did not want to do, he still found himself doing on a regular basis. So this concept of sin is something that is always with us on this side of the living. For First John says, if we say that we do not sin, we are a liar and the love of God is not within us. So we know that all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But praise be to God, we have the blood of Christ that washes us and continues to bless us on our journey to God in heaven. Matthew chapter 9 verse 13 says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. And not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God is looking for mercy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Our God is in the saving business. He sent his son to save the world from the sin that dwells within them. So we know that the church is made up of saved sinners. For after you are baptized, you do not live a perfect life. The problem is we don't look at ourselves as the church. Because the church is you. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, again... Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 2 Corinthians 2, 6, 16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We do ourselves a disservice when we wake up day in and day out and don't view ourselves as a holy priesthood, as the church, as the body of Christ, as the temple of God. What is a temple? According to Wikipedia, a temple is a structure reserved for religious or spiritual activities. A temple can also be associated with the dwelling place of a god or god. So what does God mean when he says that we are the temple of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? <coughs> for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. What does it mean to be God's people? It's interesting to me that God establishes an us versus them. He, does, he establishes light versus darkness. We would like to be all inclusive. We pray for people as we should, but we don't feel that God should do certain things the way he does to certain people depending on their response to his command. But God established an us versus them in the beginning. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, he put a distance between the Godhead and Adam and Eve. 
for they had to have a different relationship with God after that sin. And in these scriptures, God is establishing an us versus them, a light versus darkness. Because he's saying of all the people that he created, although he loves them, although he has a desire that all men would be saved, according to 1 Timothy, God is going to choose people that are going to choose him to dwell in them and to walk among them. And he will be their God and they will be his people. Think of the relationship that God had with Adam and Eve. Think of the relationship God had intimately with Noah and his family. Think of the relationship God had with Abraham. Think of the relationship that God had with Jesus. Jesus prayed in the garden that I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. God is looking for a family. Isn't that sad? The Bible is a sad love story that the creator of all things, that all things are subject to him, and at some point all things will have to give an answer to him. The creator of life, that at all times, no matter what, everything that had a beginning will have an end. And at that end, that spirit of life will come back to that creator. Of all the things that God has created and done in our human existence, God is looking for a family. He's looking for people that will want to be his sons and daughters. We learn from scripture in Romans chapter 8 verses 14 through 17 for as many are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. God is looking to have the best adoption agency known to mankind. He's looking to adopt you and me and make you co-heirs with Christ, the same Christ that he loves so much. But he gave to be the ransom, to be the propitiation for mankind's sin. God is looking to have a family. The sad thing is, people don't want to be in God's family. Even though God has for them success, love, faith, hope, God, people choose to disown God and to have their own worldly family. Instead of having a desire to be among God's spiritual people. But it's important for us as the church to love one another. For the Bible says they will know you by the love they have for one another. And it's important for us in the church to replicate the love that God has inside the Godhead and for mankind with one another. Because that's how people on the outside will have a desire to want to be a part of the inside. When people see what God has done in your life, the changes that God has made in your life, but more importantly, the way that you have allowed God to change you in your life, then people are intrigued. When you used to live this way, and now you live another way, and the only distinction between your old self and your new self is Christ Jesus, then people are turned on to a fact that, hey, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can be like that person. That's the way that God has set it up. For God knows that the relationship that mankind has with one another. So it's important for us to build our relationships within the church. As a body of Christ, knowing that we are a royal priesthood, we need to communicate with each other. We need to fellowship with each other. We need to love one another. We need to be with each other so that we can bear each other's burden. We need to practice Studying God's word with one another so that we will know how to share God's gospel with those who are on the outside. And when we do those things and we become a stronger nucleus, nothing can break us. Nothing can shake us because we are brothers and sisters bound by the love of Christ. Faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. That's why it's important to always have love for one another in our heart.
And it's important for us as we focus on those things to understand that as a church, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes we don't look at ourselves as co heirs with Christ. But our, our call for us this week, our pledge is to leave here feeling empowered, <coughs> to leave here recognizing that God is looking to be your God, and he's looking for you to be his people, and he's looking to have an intimate relationship with you. He's looking to empower you throughout the day. He's looking to free your mind. He's looking to creating you a new life, a new way of thinking to transcend from this world. Because Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he doesn't want us to be bogged down. He doesn't want us to be heavy laden. He doesn't want us to be downtrodden. He wants us to be the church of Christ. Amen? He wants us to be the body of Christ. He wants us to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. I love that passage. Because people who aren't saved don't understand the burden that people are saved have. The burden that we have is, we know when we partake of that Lord's Supper, when we take of that bread and they take of that fruit of the vine, our mind goes back into the week. Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And as the brother is reading about Jesus hanging on the cross, as the brother is reading about our responsibility to that sacrifice, our mind goes back and we remember. We remember the things we willfully did in spirit, in thought, in word, and deed. The times that we didn't take that into consideration. When we took that sacrifice as a common thing. The times when we said what we shouldn't have, or the times that we've done what we didn't have. For much as given, much is expected. We know as saved sinners that we have been forgiven of a lot. We know of all the sin in our lives. So when we come together on the first day of the week, hopefully we are relieved that we're able to come with kindred minds and spirits to remember that Jesus is still Jesus, God is still God, and he's still in the saving business. Because when we're apart from each other, when we're out in the world, sometimes we forget. But when we come back together, our spirit is renewed. Amen? So it's important for us to maintain as the body. It's important for us to maintain as that holy priesthood. It's important for us to focus our minds and our hearts on that true calling, which is to be the Church of Christ. This concept of salvation comes only through God's term. I've never understand for the life of me through mankind how we feel we can decide how to be saved when we cannot save ourselves. I don't understand how people will put their faith and their trust into someone that breathes the same air that they breathe and rely on them to tell them how to be saved. When that person is going to lay down their physical tent the same way you are, and they don't have the power to raise that tent back up. But there's one being that walked this earth that had that power. For Jesus said, no one takes my life. I willfully give my life. I have the power to give my life and to take my life back. That power has been given to me by God Almighty. So we serve a God that has power, that has the ability to do things in this realm and the next. And that God said in the beginning, let us make man <coughs> in our image and our likeness. And before the foundation of the world, knowing that we will fall short of God's glory, they made a decision to sin of themselves. 
to come down in the likeness of men, to live, but not to be tempted, but not to sin, and to willfully give God's life for mankind, to become sin on that cross, so that we would have the opportunity to come back to God through Christ Jesus. That is the gospel. That is the story in which we hold true. When those who hear that and who are not saved experience <coughs> that truth, we pray that their heart be pierced, that they have a desire to do something. For in Acts chapter 2, when those people that physically crucified Jesus was it exposed to the truth in which spiritually happened in that moment, they were pierced to the heart. And they were convicted. And it caused them to evaluate their spiritual life. And in evaluating their spiritual life, they asked a question in verse 37. For when they heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized. For the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this per per perverse generation. Praise be to God, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word, gladly received his word, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's the plea that we have every time we come together. That we look among ourselves for those that are not saved. That today would be the day that we put on Christ. But we know for those of us who have already put on Christ, life is hard. Amen. You walk down that path. You know what's in your Bible. You know the things that you're supposed to do. You know Jesus died on the cross for you. But you lose your focus. Sometimes we're a lot like Peter. At first, when we leave church Sunday, we're ready to get out the boat and walk on water. Because we're fired up. We're empowered. But by Monday, we realize, wait a minute. I'm walking on water. And we look down. And we took our focus off of Jesus. And when our focus is off of Jesus, we begin to sink. And we sink lower Tuesday. Lower Wednesday. Neglect studying the Bible with us on Wednesday night. Lower Thursday. Lower even more. Friday, Saturday. And some of us are so low, we neglect the assembly on Sunday. And then we sink lower and lower and lower. But praise be to God, hopefully Sunday morning, we come back and we say, like the prodigal son, wait a minute, I remember a place I can go where even the servants have it better than how I have here. Because Jesus didn't let Peter drown, did he? He reached out and he grabbed for him. And that's the God that we serve. That he's in a saving business continually. He doesn't save just once. He continues to save. So we ask that if you have a spiritual need at this time, if you desire to be saved, or if you desire to Confess your sins to the church and have the church pray for you. We ask that you come forward at this time. That whatever your spiritual state is at this time, you come forward as we stand and as we sing.